Now, it's not often that we devote our attention to a Swedish business giant. Boasting a population of only 10 million people in the wildest corners of the European continent, not many people expect a bustling business hub to arise from the rugged archipelagos of Scandinavia. But you'd be wrong to underestimate Sweden, and the man who proves us wrong is none other than this gritty breed of Swede, Ingvar Kamprad. In a nutshell, this fortuitous man made his fortune by selling Nordic furniture, packed in boxes and stacked across massive blue and yellow warehouses, and by combining the two colors of Sweden's flag, a blue warehouse smothered with IKEA in yellow text, Ingvar ended up placing a slice of Sweden across 49 countries. The question that remains to be answered is, how did a young Swedish farm boy become by far the biggest ambassador of Swedish business in the world? Well, in answering that, let's begin with a mini-biography of IKEA's founder, Ingvar Kamprad, and see how his journey leads him to create what we know as IKEA today. To begin with, let's take ourselves back to 1920 Sweden, populated with little more than modest villages, farmland and wild forests. Born on the 30th of March 1926, Ingvar spent his childhood in a small farming village, what's now known as Almholt. Ingvar was born to a father of German descent, with his grandfather having migrated from Thuringia in southern Germany at the time. It is believed that the Kamprad family traces itself back to Central Europe in the 14th century, having become a family of wealthy landowners in the region. His German grandfather, Achim Kamprad, left Germany in 1869 to begin a new life in Sweden. Upon moving to Sweden, he bought a farm of 449 hectares in southern Sweden. Later, and due to financial difficulties, Achim unfortunately committed suicide, leaving Ingvar's grandmother to tend to the family. Expectedly, this tragic loss for the family shaped its psychology for generations to come. Once Ingvar appeared on the scene, his family lived a strictly frugal life and shunned spending money on trifling luxuries. Haunted by their patriarch's suicide, Ingvar's parents and surviving grandmother instead believed in working hard, spending little and saving more. And predictably, this work ethic brushed onto young Ingvar too. So at the delicate age of five, Ingvar found himself running his first business. Surely he didn't waste any time there. Walking across his neighborhood, Ingvar sold matchsticks to the local residents of Almholt, and when he turned seven, he jumped on a bike and began traveling further to sell his instant burning matchsticks. He would cycle to Stockholm, Sweden's capital, and bring back a large stash of matchsticks. He discovered that he could make a larger profit by selling in bulk, and shortly afterwards, atop his two wheels, Ingvar began selling fish, seeds, even Christmas tree decorations. Later, he added ballpoint pens and pencils to his product range. Thus, junior Ingvar continued to bring back the old penny and add to his family's piggy bank. Eventually, and as time took its course, Ingvar turned 17. Having accrued a vast array of experience at such a young age, Ingvar felt ready for his next big venture. And despite being dyslexic, Ingvar performed well at school and made his father prouder. To reward his son, his father handed him a sum of cash, which Ingvar then used to start his nascent furniture business. There and then, the first embryonic shoots of IKEA began to sprout. Named after his initials, IK, and then the initials of his farm, E for Elmterid, and then his village, A for Agunarid. The first variant of IKEA kicked off by selling everyday products like jewelry, photo frames, and nylon stockings. Not owning a store, Ingvar used the telephone to contact buyers and later published a catalogue which he delivered to households in his area. By 1951, IKEA offered an expanded range of home furniture, including dining tables and shelves. In 1953, IKEA launched its first ever showroom in Almholt, where he exhibited his furniture for people to see and feel. 
What distinguished IKEA from its competition was Ingvar's enduring preference in affordability. In other words, since he prioritized saving money himself, he wished to sell the luxury of modern and visually appealing furniture, where the average customer could similarly save money. So, IKEA typically offered lower prices compared to competitors, thereby undercutting their prices and hurting their revenues. In response, local competitors began a boycott and refused to supply Ingvar with goods or material. But this turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as Ingvar simply looked overseas for suppliers and began sourcing his materials even cheaper than before. As a result, he was able to drop his prices yet again, which only spelt the end of those that wished to bring IKEA down. In his own words, Ingvar said, Why are beautiful products only made for a few buyers? It must be possible to offer good design and function at low prices. This emphasis on affordability and value for money has formed the core of its business ideology ever since. And in another plot twist, dating back to 1956, Ingvar once noticed a customer dismantling the legs of a table to squeeze it in their car. At that point, Ingvar Kamprad had a eureka moment, which changed the fortunes of his business forever. As if he wished he discovered it sooner, Ingvar realized that his products would be far better sellable if he sold them in their constituent parts instead of forcing families to squeeze whole units into their small cars. Marking a turning point, the flat pack model of selling furniture was born, where the customer only needed to buy the parts and then assemble it later themselves. Not only did this make more sense logically, but even economically. IKEA's stores could now hold a much larger inventory, as boxes of dismantled furniture obviously didn't need so much space than whole units needed. In 1958, IKEA's first retail outlet opened, where customers could shop and bag a dining table in a box instantly, straight off the shelf, and take it home without having to wait for its delivery. From that moment onwards, IKEA's fortune soared beyond the stratosphere and took Sweden by storm. In 1965, IKEA's largest store at the time opened, where thousands of people were reported to have queued in excitement. In this store, IKEA introduced its first ever self-serving warehouse alongside its showroom, enabling people to select their favorite product and purchase it from the same building. At the same time, its product range began to enlarge as it added new and modern styles of bookcases, chairs, dining tables to its range, even opening an IKEA restaurant in 1960, where people could feast on a filling meal without paying a fortune. In 1968, IKEA began to build its furniture with particle board, an inexpensive, versatile, durable form of wood that could be carved to make almost anything. If you've ever broken a piece of furniture from IKEA, you'll notice the soft and dusty particle board base resting beneath its veneered surface. And since IKEA proved so phenomenally successful in Sweden, in 1963 IKEA opened its first international store in Norway. In 1969, IKEA arrived in Denmark, later arriving in Switzerland in 1973 and in Germany a year later. Rather remarkably, in 1975, IKEA reached the other side of the world and opened its first Australian store in Sydney. Throughout the years that followed, IKEA continued to pop up across Europe, including Austria in 1977 and the Netherlands in 1979. In the next decade, IKEA's vibrant warehouses began to spring up across Western Europe, the US, and later in the UK and Italy. With its explosive popularity across the continent and beyond, IKEA also launched its loyalty program, known as IKEA Family, in 1984. Having taken over Europe and reached as far as America and Australia, an aging Ingvar retires as CEO and continued to remain an advisor for the newly created parent company Inca Holdings. With the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the subsequent end of the Cold War, IKEA finds new markets in Central and Eastern Europe and even opens its first store in China by 1998. And keeping abreast of fast-changing developments in technology, IKEA swiftly joins the internet boom in 2000 and begins retailing its products on its website, as it still does today. Having become a global phenomenon, IKEA continued to expand into new frontiers from the sunny isles of the Dominican Republic to the blooming metropolises of Japan. What's more, 
Not only did IKEA bring a raft of affordable and contemporary furniture to the middle classes of the world, but also a taste of Swedish cuisine, which otherwise many people would probably not have a clue of. See, when anyone enters an IKEA store, one of its most imposing features is its restaurant, not least because of the price in which you can fill yourself. From the restaurant, you can find a selection of Swedish foods like its buttery and fried meatballs, its traditional lingered berry jam, as well as other eateries like hot dogs, pancakes, salmon and roast bread. Furthermore, you need not necessarily sit in its restaurant to enjoy Swedish delicacy, as it has always offered a pre-packaged range of foods that you can take home to cook and eat in the comfort of your own home. As the heart of its service, ultimately, is a focus on bringing Sweden to your plate without emptying your pockets. Evidently, Ingvar Kamprad spared not a single touch of Sweden in its products range, be it in food or furniture. And on many occasions, Ingvar made it to lofty positions on the Forbes list, coming in at 11th in 2010 with a net worth of $23 billion. In 2015, he was listed as the 8th wealthiest in the world with a net worth exceeding $50 billion. And although Ingvar delegated much of the ownership of IKEA to the Inkar Trust Fund, meaning he or his children couldn't treat it as their pet business, the larger numbers are simply testament to the astounding success that IKEA has achieved. Today, it boasts 403 giant outlets in 46 countries with a revenue of $47.6 billion as of 2017. Moving back to Ingvar Kamprad, what's interesting is that despite reaching such lavish positions in wealth, he never entirely gave up on his frugality and focus on saving money. He was often seen driving a Volvo, flew economy class, stayed in budget hotels, and even reprimanded employees for leaving lights switched on in the offices. At one point in 1994, Ingvar fell into controversy when it was divulged that he was involved in a Swedish fascist organization during his youth, reportedly between 1942 and 1945. Calling it the most stupid mistake of my life, Ingvar apologized to both his employees and the outside world. Nevertheless, despite swimming in oceans of wealth, Ingvar remained closest to an ordinary person that a wealthy tycoon could become. He himself claimed that his down-to-earth persona propelled him to success, because in his own words, he said, at heart I am one of them, ordinary people therefore claiming to know what the ordinary person truly liked. In January 2018, this ordinary yet extraordinarily prosperous being died from a bout of pneumonia at the age of 91. Most notably in a tribute to him, Ingvar's story is one that radiates with humility, timeless effort, and resultantly a success that's sweet to the taste buds of any observer. So, what do you make of Ingvar Kampra's life and IKEA? Do you buy their furniture? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. If you've enjoyed this, please consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing. Thank you all for watching. I will see you soon. Continuing to share great business stories past and present and whatever else happens in the business world. So thank you all and have an excellent rest of your day.